Thank you, Neil. Thank you for sharing with us all the fond memories of Chambers and your very practical views of how the arbitration procedure can be improved. We will bear all these in mind and strive for excellence for Chambers to serve the arbitration world and the community. To set the scene for the panel discussion, we are delighted to have the Honorable Mr. Justice Robert Tang, non-permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal, Hong Kong SAR, and a seasoned independent arbitrator to give a keynote speech, Mr. Justice Tang. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. International arbitration has come a very long way. I remember the steering committee in the 1980s, which led to the establishment of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. We should thank those with the, who had the foresight in the early 1980s to see the potential importance of international arbitration to Hong Kong, which was then an emerging international financial center. There were people in the private sector, for example, uh, Helmut Solman, in the public sector, John Griffiths, Michael Thomas, John Brambridge, the financial secretary. Neil Kaplan straddled the two. First, in the Attorney General's chambers and then in private practice. He was relentless, both inside and out, in promoting arbitration and Hong Kong as an international arbitration center. So I think we have a lot to thank Neil for. The business community in Hong Kong, local and international, lawyers, locals and internationals, were great supporters too. The business community and I think the lawyers provided manpower, and if I'm not mistaken, at the very beginning, also some financial support. With such support, HKIC was established. True to its name, it was international in its makeup and practice, and has remained so. The Hong Kong government helped with some seed money, as well as providing the premises. They were provided and received on the clear understanding that HKIC must be allowed to conduct its affairs without government interference. The Hong Kong government has kept its word. Now, more than ever, the central government as well as the Hong Kong government appreciate the importance of maintaining Hong Kong as an international arbitration center it is easier than one thinks. I say, just continue with what has made international arbitration in Hong Kong a success. Lawyers, especially non-Hong Kong lawyers, whether from the common law, whether from common law jurisdiction or other systems of law, must be welcome. And in immigration must not be an impediment. A high regard for the rule of law must be maintained. HKIC, which has always been highly international in its running, makeup, and outlook, should remain so. Apart from giving arbitration support when necessary, such as keeping Hong Kong abreast with international development, the Hong Kong government should leave arbitration to be run by petitioners and independent bodies such as the HKIC. I will not continue on this theme because there are speakers who are much better qualified than I. But I thought I might share with you my experience in arbitration. As you probably know, I have had a long career. Since my retirement in October 2018, I have been in arbitrator. Before that, apart from 14 years on the bench, I was a practicing barrister and was in silk 
for 18 years. When I was in practice, I sometimes appear as advocate in arbitrations. It is easy to think that advocacy is unimportant or less important in arbitration. There isn't the cut and thrust of a court hearing when an advocate can expect deep probing from the bench and where skillful efficacy can be demonstrated. But thinking more deeply about it, I think it would be a mistake to think that efficacy is less important in arbitration, although it would not be the same kind of efficacy that one sees in court. Just think of it as persuasion. Persuasion is important. Everyone will agree that in arbitration, a party will want to persuade the tribunal that it is right. Its importance is obvious. Some might think all the facts are there. The arbitrators have detailed submissions. Surely they can find their way to the right answer. I do not think it is that simple. My experience as an advocate, a judge, and even as an arbitrator tells me, written submissions often do not have the desired effect. One can read the written submissions carefully and not get a point. But since oral efficacy is rare in arbitration, what should one do? In arbitration, unlike litigation, appeals are well nigh impossible. So mistakes will not be corrected and one has only one chance. That makes the art of persuasion so much more important. Of course, I have in mind disputes where the merits are not one-sided. In the case, say, where one party is playing for time, the merits are clear, there's little need for persuasion. But where there are, where there are genuine disputes, and a large number of arbitrations fall within this category, Advocacy can be decisive. Too often, parties produce lengthy written submissions. I can understand why. In arbitrations, tribunals tend to be reticent, and the advocates have no way of knowing what the tribunal is thinking, so they want to cover every conceivable point. I think it is helpful to the parties for the tribunal to be more forthcoming in the common law world with its oral tradition, intervention is common and is regarded as helpful. When judges push, they expect to be pushed back. But not so much, I think, in non-common law jurisdictions. Under other systems of law, interventions might be construed as bias and advocates may not welcome tough probing. So arbitrators have to tread carefully since they would not know where enforcement might be sought. I believe that is why even where a tribunal is composed of common law practitioners, they are often quite passive. As I said, my experience is that parties supply lengthy written submissions. They are lengthy for a reason because often they do not know what the tribunal is thinking. Unfortunately, sometimes they only find out when they receive the award. I think when possible, parties should ask for an opportunity for an oral submissions hearing. Recently, I was involved in an arbitration where all three arbitrators, before the oral submissions, supplied the parties with lists of questions. I believe the questions and answers help to clear the air and may well make a difference to the outcome. Even so, oral submissions tend to be brief, and there's always a possibility that the tribunal might think it has understood your point, but actually had not, and pertinent questions had not been asked. So how does one make the best use of written submissions? Recently, I've been thinking about whether a page was new reminded me word limit should be imposed on submissions. I've not done so so far, but I wonder whether we are doing the parties any favors 
for not doing so. Without a page limit, very often submission only ends when nothing further could possibly be said. As a result, the cogency suffers. With a page or word limit, one has to prioritize. And I believe good efficacy requires one to prioritize. And to emphasize or only put forward good points. Without a page limit, some advocates do not want to be thought lazy. Clients do not always appreciate that it takes more effort and time to, pro to produce something short. Worse still, what if the other party with a much longer submission wins? Might it be thought that the result would have been different if your side had produced an equally long submission? A page limit, I think, also removes well-meaning suggestions by one's colleagues and clients, which one is too polite not, in, not to include when there is no page limit. I believe a page limit will help advocates and the parties. Of course, the parties must have an adequate opportunity to present their cases, so the page limit must be reasonable. Suppose there's a page limit. What should the advocate do? How should the written submission be prepared? Litigation is easier because of the pushback from the bench. If an argument is not having its desired effect, the advocate can tell from the court's reaction and can change tact to put the same arguments in a better way or to come back with a brilliant retort which clears the fog. But one rarely has such an opportunity in arbitration. So what should one do? How does one improve one's odds? Normally, in arbitration, pleadings are comprehensive. So the party's arguments are well known. I can understand why one may want to cover all the arguments in the opening. Even so, I think it is important to prioritize the arguments. In, the, in litigation, certainly in the old days, in the days of oral efficacy, the opening is important. Sometimes one's opponents fold after the opening. Sometimes the plaintiff, on seeing that the opening falling flat on his face, falls. Arguments which seem plausible in writing, especially when well padded, may sound hollow when it is articulated. In arbitration, the opening provides the opportunity for the parties to give a good impression, so the opportunity should not be wasted. Before I think one prepares a written submission, I think it's useful to begin with an internal dialogue. Ask yourself, why the tribunal should decide in your favor? It is highly unlikely that there are 10 good reasons. And I've been in the game for so long, I know, very rarely does one have more than one or two good reasons. Remember, I'm talking about cases which could go either way. You don't want it to tip to the other side. So, there may only be one or two good reasons. Of course, the reasons may not be simple and will need elaboration. There may be factual disputes and they will take time to explain. And of course, arbitrations often involve more than one claim and one has to perform the exercise for each of them. But I can see no reason why one cannot, for each claim, explain what are the essential facts and the law, and why one should succeed. Even when there are factual disputes, most cases are decided on documents and inherent probabilities. Cross-examination is overrated. One can deal with factual disputes on paper, but it is important to remember not to be bogged down in the details. There could be too much of a good thing. One should always identify one's best point or points and put them at the forefront. One should do so in the opening, but it is even more important in the closing.
is there any reason why one's best poems cannot be stated shortly? Many cases, I think most cases, can be explained in a few minutes or in a few pages. I think it's difficult to imagine a case which just takes, ten, takes more than 10 minutes to explain or two or three pages to state. Look at the headnotes in the law reports. Do they, do they not summarize facts and law in one or two pages? Why, shouldn't, why should not one's written submission, at least to begin with, one should be concise? The handbook set out the facts, the points in dispute, or points in, or points in dispute, and, and, and why uh, it was decided in a certain way. I think an advocate should try to do the same. I think in efficacy, as in poetry, concentration without elimination is important. It will take time to accomplish, but I believe it will be worth it. The written submission should be written so that it will be read, understood, and not forgotten. If one genuinely has a good case, state it as simply as one can. It can be time consuming, but it will be worthwhile. It is in particularly important when it comes to the written closing submissions. And surely by then, one should know what one's best points are, and that is also one's last chance. That is what trial lawyers do. They know, especially with a busy court, one has little time to make one's point. Often, one is under similar time constraints in arbitrations. But overall, I believe arbitrations are less, arbitrators are less abrupt and tend to keep an open mind longer. In litigation, in most cases, at the conclusion of the hearing, the court has a fair idea which side is going to win. In a minority of cases, the court is unsure. There are some cases where there are likely to be disagreement. Very often, on the same day or soon after, the judges will meet and find out what everyone thinks and see if, they, and see if there's consensus. I believe that in the highest court in the UK, after the conclusion of the hearing, judges would go around the table with the most junior judges saying what they think and why. That is a very good discipline. If there is potential disagreement, drafts will be prepared and circulated, sometimes with the view of garnering a majority. Arbitrations tend to be more straightforward. They also tend to be less immediate. Often the written submissions are produced a few weeks later. Arbitrators can and do take their time. That is good and bad. Good because, as I say, arbitrators keep an open mind longer. Bad because an arbitrator might not have prepared for or followed the proceedings with as us, with us much care. They know they have plenty of time. That is where the written closing submission comes in. It should be short and to the point. A 100 page plus submission is not going to work. One should remember that when there are three arbitrators, they are likely to work at different speed. Some are quicker than others. Some are more decisive. Some tend to take their time. How do you convince the slow, keep or turn the quick in your favor? The closing submission provides the last word and should be read and would be read with most care. So if you write it in such a way that it sticks in the mind, it will help arbitrators who have not yet made up their mind. A long and tedious repetition won't do it. One can hear an imagined groan, not again, not another 100 page written closing submission. I have talked about imposing page limits and try to justify it by appealing to the self-interest of the parties. So that's easy. 
international arbitrations are here to stay. I can, one can tell from the people attending here. New talk about uh, barristers in arbitration. What I want to say is that in Hong Kong, it is not uncommon for barristers to be instructed in international arbitration. And I think barristers should not think that because they do not have an exclusive right of audience, somehow they are at a disadvantage. My experience, brief though it may be, has told me from dealing with course applications that the side which have instructed barristers, sometimes three or four of them, tend to have the lower aggregate bill. <laughs> so barristers are highly competitive, and for a good reason, because you have lower overheads. And, and, and I think uh, they are more used to doing that kind of work. So they spend less time uh, on doing whatever they have to do. So barristers are highly competitive, at least in Hong Kong. And I don't see why it should not be otherwise everywhere. It should be otherwise everywhere. International arbitration are here to stay. Too much is at stake. And I do not believe international businesses will ever willingly agree to dispute resolution by national courts for all the obvious reasons. Governments understand that, so they have wisely left international arbitration alone. So it's left to the petitioners to make the most of it. A more difficult question than persuasion is how does one ensure that arbitration remains efficient and cost effective. I mentioned earlier what I politely describe as comprehensive pleadings. What can be done about it? What incentive is there to improve? It is easy to talk about efficacy and the importance of brevity because it is in the interest of the parties who want to win. But what about other improvements? Even in a jurisdiction with a well-developed legal profession, strong and a so strong judiciary, that's a perennial problem. In, arbit in international arbitration, no government intervention is tolerable. It is unrealistic, though, to expect arbitrators to be disciplinarians. Arbitration is too ad hoc for that to work. I confess I've been thinking about it and I simply have no idea. But I know one thing, improve or decay. So I leave that thought with you. Thank you.